Hi, D Darren. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Hi. We're going to wait just a little bit, guys, until we have people coming in. Um, we're going to give people a little bit of time to get in here, and then we will get started. We'll introduce ourselves, and we'll go from there. Welcome. All right, guys, we're going to just take a few minutes again to uh, let people come in um, and then we'll get started right after that. All right, guys, so we will say, um, I will say that I'm excited that you uh, students, that you guys are here. Um, Dean Thomas and I were just having a conversation before now uh, with hoping that we would have people who wanted to show up to the lecture because we actually, we really want to hear it. So we were, we were excited to be able to, um, to have this today just to kind of give you guys a little bit of a a sneak peek into um, sort of an academic experience or a, a classroom experience at William and Mary. Um, I can, if you hear Sesame Street in the background, I will tell you I have a, um, a almost two year old, I have an 18 month old, so that's probably what you hear playing. Um, my name is Tish Kennedy. I'm one of the associate deans in the undergraduate admissions office at William and Mary. Um, and I'm going to hang out to number one, enjoy Professor Rio Frio's uh, lecture. Uh, but in addition, just I wanted to take the time to welcome you guys. Um, we're really excited to have you here. We know that the academic experience is a lot of what draws students to William & Mary. Um, the community is certainly exceptionally important, but you do want to know what that classroom experience is going to be like. So we're really excited about this today. Um, I'm going to pass things over to uh, Dean Thomas, who um, what this program, this You Belong program is kind of a joint effort with the two of us. <laughs> We've been working together to get this to you guys. Um, typically, it's a, of course, this is a, a different year, but it's an on-campus on program um, where you have the opportunity to really get to know the community at William & Mary, but we wanted to make sure that we brought that to you guys. Um, even doing so digitally, we wanted to make sure that we brought that to you so you could, you could get a feel before you were here. Um, so I'm going to pass on to Dean Thomas to introduce herself, and then what we're going to do is we're going to disappear, and we're going to let the professor have at it uh, and do his thing, and you guys will see that you have the option to raise your hand, um, and Professor Real Frail would prefer to hear you, so we're going to call on you, and we'll unmute your mic if you have questions or comments throughout so that you can ask those questions out loud instead of having to type them in, all right? Take it away, Dean Thomas. I just wanted to say welcome. My name is Jackie Thomas and I'm assistant dean over in the undergraduate, over in the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. Uh, like Tish said, I'm excited. Uh, Kennedy <laughs> said that we're both excited about this and we hope that y'all are excited about the lecture that's about to take place. Like just from the brief little looks at the content, I am thirsty for the knowledge that's about to come. <laughs> The learning is about to be had. So just wanted to say welcome. And though we are not in person, I do feel like this is a great opportunity to learn some more things about the best parts 
of William and Mary, and by the best parts, I mean the people. So <laughs> you're getting a little bit of engagement with the very best parts of William and Mary, which to me has been the individuals that make the walls uh, a home and to make everybody feel welcome. So I'm excited, but thank you for joining us. And now I guess we'll both kick it over <laughs> to Professor Rio Frio to start the lecture and for us to all learn something new or to engage in some really good dialogue. Great, great. Thanks so much, Tish and Jackie. Um, this is a very, very new kind of bizarre experience for me. Um, I've been doing these sneak peek mock lectures for probably I don't know, maybe four or five years in a row. I've been at William & Mary for 11. Uh, I'm a professor of Latinx studies and Hispanic studies. I also direct Latin American studies. My courses uh, run the range from a course on the US-Mexico border to a course on the American dream. I co-taught a course twice on race and education. So I'm passionate about these topics. Um, and the reason that this is such a strange experience is that in the last four or five years, uh, I look forward to this event. Usually what happens is I get a, an email uh, sometime in the busiest part of the semester and I say, yeah, yeah, definitely I'll do that. And I love doing this mock lecture because it allows me to get in front of a room full of um, smart, motivated, admitted students who just want to get a sense of what William Mary's like. And so what usually happens is that I give a 45, 50 minute, um, a lecture is really the wrong word. Uh, I don't like to lecture in my classes. We do a lot of dialogue. So I'll ask questions, I'll get responses, we'll have small group conversations, and we'll kind of come to our ideas together. This experience is very bizarre because the only thing I can see are Jackie and Tish's photographs from their profile. So I have no idea who's out there. I'm just going to trust that you're there, that you're listening, that you're excited. And um, we're going to try to negotiate this very weird moment together to try to come to sort of some understanding of um, my topic today, which is social location. And the idea is basically um, for us to think about how we know the things that we know and why we believe the things that we believe, all right? So we're gonna give this a shot. This could be technologically a disaster. And then we'll just, if it is, we'll just sort of figure out some Q and A and we can have just a, some time to chat. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to try to share my screen here. Uh, okay. So let's put it on that. Oh, I skipped ahead, sorry about that. So let's start right with this one. Uh, and what we're gonna look at is this idea of social location. A definition that I pulled, this comes from social psychology. My field is literary and cultural studies, but this is from social psychology. And the definition that gets offered here is that social location is the particular nexus in time of categories that make up our identities. So let's, um, let's, let's do an experiment. I'm gonna ask those of you that are in the audience to give me, um, to go ahead and, and mic in. So let Jackie or Tish know that you wanna participate and let me know what you think are the most important words in this definition and, and let's try to figure out what this all means. So I could ask, for example, what's a nexus? What are the categories? Let's, let's have a, an open conversation. Oh, I see some hands raised. So, yeah, so it sounds to me like it's, basically saying like your social location is like has to do with where you are when you are there like what groups you would identify with um and so that would be like if you are part of a specific social group that would be part of your social location and if you are participating in a specific field of study that might be part of it as well okay perfect darren that's great that's great let me let me i see some other hands so let me hear some from some other folks too. Does somebody want to take a stab at the word nexus? What's a nexus? Oh, I can see all it. Okay, I can I can see that there's an Aaron here and an Adrian and Darren. Okay. Anybody know what a nexus is? Want to take a stab at it? So a nexus would be like an intersection. Yeah, yeah, perfect, exactly. Okay, so what we've got in this definition, I wanna keep in mind some of the things that Darren offered because they're definitely related. But what we have is the particular, and what that means in this context is the individual, right? So the individual intersections coming together in time 
of categories that make up our identities, right? So let's break that down even further. Together, let's come up with a list of categories that make up our identities. Darren started to gesture at this point already, but let's get really specific. So um, collaboratively, let's come up with a list of categories that make up our identities. Gender would be a category. Absolutely, gender's a category. What else? Age would probably play into it. Yes, definitely, right? If we start to think about something like the generation gap, right? Um, the, I, I love the, the proliferation of the hashtag OK Boomer, right? That's a clear indication of the way in which age uh, affects how we think about our identities. Great, what else? Race? Yes, definitely. Race. What else? Are these in the chat? Let me see what's happening in the chat. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. So Jackie's writing some of these down. That's perfect. Gender, age, race. What else? National social heritage. Yes, national heritage. Go ahead, Darren. Uh, social class. Yes, social class, national heritage. You know, with national heritage, let's go ahead and expand that to citizenship, right? Let's think about whether or not someone is here uh, with doc documentation, without documentation, um, on a visa as a foreign national versus having been born here. So citizenship and national heritage. Good, what else? Religion. Yes, absolutely, religion. I know this is an awkward format, but this is going really great. So let's come up with, um, what do we have so far? We've got like six or seven. Can we maybe get to 12? Education level. Absolutely, absolutely. Educational attainment. So in that way we might say, uh, did someone uh, get to high school, finish high school? Do they have an advanced degree or not? Good, what else? Could you have something about your um, like about your personal interest and what you choose to do? Yeah, because all I, these have been like sort of things that are out of largely out of the individual's control. Right, 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 right. Let's um, it doesn't sound like a particularly sophisticated word, but I think it's really important. Let's put it just hobbies. Let's just say like hobbies and um. Uh, maybe social engagements. I think that's absolutely a huge part of our identity. Can you all, yeah, you all can see the chat, right? So you see our list, our running list so far. Anything we're missing on there? Orientation. Yes, do you mean sexual orientation? That's where you were heading, but that, yes, that works. Sexual orientation, perfect. We can also add ethnicity. It's related to race, but distinct. Anything else in there? I'm going to give us maybe one more minute to look at that list and think, see if there's anything else that pops out at us. Anything else that uh, you think would make up our identity? Something that's particularly important to how we see ourselves? Career, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. So employment, definitely. Right, and we can begin to think about how that can be broken down into categories, broader categories like blue collar versus white collar, right? So definitely employment. Anything else? We could add to that list disability, right? So ability. Okay. So if anybody thinks of another one, just jump in. Let me um, see if I can move my slide to the next one. Okay. I think I'm gonna have to do it this way. 
All right, so here's, here's uh, some of the ones that I thought about. Uh, do you see any on there that we didn't talk about? We didn't talk about political affiliation. That seems like an important one, particularly over the last maybe a decade or so, we've seen a very a marked bifurcation to where political affiliation has become an even bigger. What about geography? Can somebody explain to me really briefly how they think geography might impact our identity? Well, people talk about things like being very connected to the mountains or very connected to the ocean. And so I can see how that could play into identity. Yeah, great, great. Or even uh, if, we, if we think about um, usually the dichotomy, for example, coming from a rural area versus an urban area, if you grow up in Richmond, is that going to feel different from growing up in, um, uh, I don't know, um, rural West Virginia, right? You can imagine how these two things might give you very different uh, identities, right? Any, anything else that people want to ask about these categories? What about family structure? Can somebody explain to me what, what, what I meant by family structure on this slide? Like whether or not your family is together? Yeah. Like if your parents are divorced? Right, great, that's perfect, Darren. So we can think about, again, all of this is in terms of how we see our own identities. So you can imagine how if you grew up in uh, what we might call, or what I think used to be called the traditional family, right? mother, father, sibling, uh, 1.2 siblings and a dog. Um, but we also have uh, people who are um, the children of single parents. We have some folks who grew up with their grandparents or with aunts and uncles in the house. Uh, you could envision uh, step siblings. So family structures are widely varied and that variation is gonna have an impact on how we sort of have a sense of our own identity, right? Uh, anybody, let me pause for a second. Any thoughts or questions about any of this stuff so far? Okay, cool. So let me go back for a second. Here's our original definition. The particular nexus, and I believe it was Adrian who told us that a nexus is an intersection. So the particular nexus in time of categories that make up our identities. We've got a whole list of categories why, what do we mean by in time? Why is that phrase not only sort of like isolated within the sentence, the definition, but why do you think it matters? What, what do we mean by in time? It could I mean, be the a reference to how identities change over time. Yeah, can you say a little bit more about that? For example, someone might grow up in a household that identifies with one party and that's what they identify with, a one political party. And then as they grow up and explore more, they decide that they align with something else and so a different political party. And so that changes kind of how they see the other categories of their identity. Yes, perfect. So in other words, one way to think about this phrase of in time is that it, it reflects our own individual change over time in terms of those categories. Is there another way that we can think about in time? I think it could also refer to how when you are like the, yeah, sorry, um, like the social atmosphere of America, for example, for example, is different today than it was a hundred years ago. Yes. So yes, if yes. you're the same person, that will change how you view yourself. That's exactly right. That's perfect. Um, this phrase in time uh, addresses both of these points that our individual categories or these individual um, aspects change over the course of our lifetime individually, but they also, as Darren just mentioned, they change historically. Okay, so let's keep both of those things in mind. Um, and uh, Holly and Aaron, if you guys have anything to add, jump right in, don't be shy. If I were, if I were in the room with you, I would be sharing my um, ambitious, energetic, enthusiastic eye contact to all of you, just like pulling you in, all right? Okay, so here we go. Let's see what else we can do. Uh, okay, so what I've got here, does anybody know what these are? You might know the bottom one. Do you know what the other two, the top two are? The 
They look like soundboards. Okay, right, good. So the top two are, are what we call stereo equalizers. And so when all of us had a stereo at home, if you had a nice one, you had up there the Kenwood, you had something like that that allowed you to control the individual levels of the sound. The bottom image is obviously a soundboard. So if any of you have recorded music uh, or done anything like that, we have um, at William Mary's Library in the Media Center, you have access to all this recording equipment. You'll come across something like that. But what I want us to think about is that this image here, I want us to think about all those categories that we talked about. So let me see if I can go back in my PowerPoint slide for a second. If we think about all these categories, all right, Think about all those categories existing on a, on a soundboard like this. They have higher and lower levels. And what that means is that for our individual identity, these categories are either more or less important, right? So in my case, let's just say that um, at this point in my life, as a person, my family structure is very important. I work on uh, Latinx issues, so the concept of citizenship, my own uh, privilege as a US citizen might be something I think about constantly. Um, maybe since I'm in my late 40s uh, and it hurts to play soccer, maybe age is really important to me, right? So this changes over time. When I was 18, age didn't matter very much at all. So we can start to think about how all of these categories exist, right, on, these, on this stereo equalizer, okay? So what I want to do first is to think about how these can change historically over time, all right? And what I want to think about first is um, to think about how we represent uh, women, all right? So I'm going to show you a couple of slides, and I want you to think about what these images tell us about uh, women in the current historical moment, all right? Okay, so here come the slides. Okay, I'm going to go backwards through them one more time. This is from a list, a collection that I found of women smiling while eating salad. All right, so let's talk about what these images suggest about certain ideas, concepts about what we value in our society. Thoughts? I'll keep scrolling back and forth through them while you tell me what you think. What do these images say? How do we interpret them? What do they mean? I think that they kind of show that we value health. Okay, right. So one is an image of health, a particular kind of health. Good. What else? Women are content or will be content when they eat healthy. Yes, exactly. So in other words, women are at their happiest when they're consuming uh, healthy foods like salads. Other thoughts? Anything about beauty standards, for example, in these images? I noticed that there is only a, si a certain size of woman. So yes. Some body, po like, well, some body things there. They're only slimmer women. It's majority women who are visibly white. And yes. Uh, so saying that maybe heavier women or heavier people don't value salad or eating. Uh, that's right. That, that's exactly right. This image of, uh, I'm sorry, I get super enthusiastic. So in other words, yes, we have one particular body type. They're all relatively thin, relatively the same size. Uh, we don't have anybody who has a different body type, which, which makes an implicit assumption about what healthy looks like. Okay. Other thoughts about these images? Anybody else? Why aren't they eating a hamburger? Why, why don't we have a list of women smiling while eating a burger? Because that isn't an ideal for women in our society. Right, exactly. In other words, we've, we've sort of associated women with a particular way of being in the world that includes being sort of like um, 
maybe demure, right? Demure, like very small portions, and then they are sort of like uh, daintily eating their salad. We don't have a giant burger. I don't know about all of you, but the women in my house love a good burger, right? But that's not how we choose to represent femininity, okay? So let me, anybody want to add to this? Any observations about all this? Okay, so let me go back to my list here. Here's our categories. And what I want us to think about now is um, what is it that makes these categories more or less important to us? So let me give you guys a couple of scenarios. Uh, let's say that I am, a, um, I am a queer high school male, all right, that has gone to a high school that is, um, I would say, low-grade homophobic. And what I mean by that is maybe not nothing outwardly awful, but, you know, the kind of gay jokes and this kind of stuff. So I, I'm, a, I'm a gay high school male, and I've gone to a homophobic a slightly homophobic high school, and I've, I've since come to a place like William and Mary where we're much freer to be who we are, it's a supportive environment. How do you think that the scale of sexuality, right, on this image, would, would the person's sexuality go up or down from the move to high school to college? What do you think and why? I, th I think that it could go either way, depending on the person. Um, like, okay. you, you could imagine someone saying, now that I am not constantly being reminded of it, I don't feel it as, like, such a presence on defining who I am, and so that would go down. Or you could say, now I feel more free to express myself in the way that I would want to, and so in that way it would move up. And so I think that's individual. Okay. okay, perfect. So you can't, I, you can't see my face, I don't think. I, I think you can only see the screen, but I have a huge smile on my face because I love that answer. Uh, that's exactly right. I love the way in which Darren's picked up on the fact that that's very individual and also has laid out to us the way in which both of these possibilities are very palpable, concrete. You could envision, just like you said, a student um, who's suddenly free to express their sexuality without fear of repercussion that making their sexuality more important, or you can see in which a case where a situation where because sexuality suddenly becomes no big deal in this context, it, it becomes less important, right? Uh, let me give you another ex scenario. Um, oh, let me just check the chat real quick, make sure there's nothing I'm missing here. Uh, oh, you can, you can see my excitement. Okay, good, all right. So uh, second scenario question, uh, you have a, you are a female, and you have graduated from William Mary. You decided that you loved Williamsburg and you stuck around and went to William Mary Law School. And you have since graduated William Mary Law School. You've just gotten a job at a law firm, and you look around and you notice that none of the other, none of the partners in the law firm are women. What does that do to your gender on your stereo equalizer? What do we think? I feel like it would go up because it's suddenly much more noticeable. Your okay, and, and what, what do you think that would, tell me a little bit more about that. Is this Adrian? Yes, this is Adrian. Okay, Adrian, tell me a little bit more about that. Um, just, I've noticed in my own life that I don't really think about my gender unless I'm reminded of it. Mm -hmm. And I tend to be reminded of it more when I'm in situations where I am in the minority in that aspect. Okay, perfect. So we have a clear uh, context in which a female graduate of a law school walks into a law firm and suddenly realizes, wait a second, there are no female law partners. Now I'm hyper aware of being a woman. Can anyone articulate a counter scenario? And what we're doing here is we're building on Darren's suggestion that in these cases, it can be individual and go either way. Can anyone see how in that same scenario, someone's, that woman's 
that student that I'm describing, right, that graduate, why their gender would go down on their equalizer? Maybe because it's not something that can be shared with other people in that environment. Right. So it might be the situation where in that context, they decide I need to downplay my womanness, whatever that means, right, in this context and really not make it a big deal in my mind that I'm a woman in this context. So the, the point I'm emphasizing is that these categories and their relative importance to us shift both in time, but they also shift depending on the context and the scenarios that we're involved in, right? And I don't have a slide for this, but the, the way I wanna sort of phrase this is that our social location then has an impact on the kinds of experiences we have, right? So can you help me understand how when we think about all of these categories, right? So let's go back here. How might these categories impact the kinds of experiences we have? I feel like they make up every experience you have. I mean, if you change any one of them, you're going to have a drastically different experience from your day to day life by just changing any one of these categories. Okay, that's I agree 100%. Can you can you be a, um, give me something specific? So can you think about how one of these in particular might affect our experiences? Uh, I think well, I'm from the South and I mm -hmm. think I would have a totally different um, childhood and a totally different relationship with my, my gender as a, a woman and kind of social relationships. If I grew up, say, in New York or in the North where it's, you know, a little bit more progressive than Houston, Texas, I think my geographic location would completely change how I view my gender in relation to, you know, societal standards. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so what begins to happen is that your social location, right, your particular combination of all of these categories begins to have an impact or, or is rather impacted by the kinds of experiences you have, right? So for example, if you grow up in an area that um, identifies as deeply politically conservative, right, or, or deeply politically liberal, whichever one you want to think about, if you grow up in that environment, that is going to absolutely shape the kinds of experiences you have around politics and political affiliation, right? Now, let's flip the script. We can also say that our experiences then have a huge impact on our social location. So let me repeat this phrase. Social location has an impact on our experiences and our experiences have an impact on our social location. Can you give me an example of the latter? How do our experiences shape our social location? I think the clearest way where that can be impacted is in the area of political affiliation, okay. where you have a certain experience and because now you've had that experience, your mind has changed about politics. Great, great. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I teach a course on the Latinx novel, right? So we look at um, Latinx, contemporary Latinx novels. Some of my students uh, come from areas that have not had much exposure to recently arrived immigrants. For them, that course can often shift their understanding of both immigrants as communities and also immigration as a dynamic, right? So that's the experience of my classroom and the experience of reading those texts shifts their understanding. That shift, right, can have an impact on their social location. It might slightly alter, for example, how they view citizenship. It might slightly alter how they view political affiliation. It might slightly alter how they understand the importance of geography, right? Anybody have questions or comments about this stuff? Could you also say that like, aside from an experience of like emotion, say you could have like a physical one, like for example, if you have an experience that leaves you physically disabled that would be that would play into the ability category without necessarily changing your viewpoint on anything yeah absolutely and i think and i think that what's what's really important and I, I love that you picked up on the ability one darren because you know ability most of these categories uh are 
probably less flexible, right? Uh, for example, we like to think that political affiliation is flexible, but people tend to be what their parents were, right? This is not always the case, but we, and, and they get more rigid as we get older, right? The, the ones that we can, and gender obviously can change in terms of uh, folks that are transgender, but generally speaking, our genders remain um, fixed, right? We can think about how something like ability though, age and ability, we are all destined for those to change and our relationship to those will change. I heard somewhere a disability scholar say that uh, all of us at some point will become disabled. And what they meant by that is that if we run the course of the aging process, it affects all of us eventually. And so in other words, our understanding of ourselves through the concept of ability, right? What we can and can't do, those things will absolutely shift over time and they'll impact how we see ourselves and how we see the world, right? Comments, questions? All right, th this is great. You guys are amazing. So let me just um, take you through one more sort of a couple of like really random examples. I, I do like to talk about how um, our social location then is something that we very much take for granted. So in other words, uh, unless we're in an environment that enables us, that encourage us to question these categories and to think about them actively, we usually are simply sitting with these categories without really considering how they're shaping our worldview, right? And so what I wanna do is I'm gonna go past our uh, women laughing while eating salad. And I want us to think about, just really quickly, I'm gonna show you some images of masculinity and think about uh, the way definitions of masculinity have shifted over time, right? So um, this is the called the underwear section of the lecture, right? So on the left, well, my left, I can't tell what it is for you. On my left, you have the um, 70s, like that. that is super 70s, right, under flare. And then on the right, you have a more contemporary representation of uh, another underwear ad that's contemporary. Right? So think about how both of these two images are marketing both a vision of masculinity uh, and also an idea of what masculinity is supposed to be. If we go on in this, we'll see that these are two figures from the 60s and 70s. That's Paul Newman on the left, and the bigger image is Clint Eastwood, who you might now know as an old man at some point was young. This is 60s and 70s masculinity. Let's compare that to contemporary visions of masculinity, right? I, I don't know who all those people, I think one of them is a vampire. One of them used to be the guy on the office and I don't know, is the other one Thor? I don't know. Uh, but let me go back through these for just a second and let's take a moment and share with me what you notice about how masculinity has changed historically. I think one thing that's very apparent is that it used to be much more focused on like anger um, and like that was seen as a masculine trait and now that has become much at least much more subdued compared to what it used to be like okay, with the, sorry like go with ahead the, Derek. yeah sorry with the um with the previous slide uh you have the guy holding up his fists um and like staring into the distance intently clearly focused on something whereas in the more modern view there's a guy that's saying oh crap and that's still viewed as masculine mm -hmm. um so that's one way in which it's changed okay good and, and i think that this we can we can this is not on the slide but we can think about much more recently the prevalence of the term toxic masculinity has become sort of something that that's very familiar terrain and that that shifts how we think about what what it is to be a man. Anybody have some other uh, observations about how these various photographs demonstrate a shift in masculinity? Muscles are more defined in the more recent photographs. Absolutely, absolutely. Look at the difference. Both of these men, right? And actually, this the one on the left here. Um, these were all considered like paragons of masculinity. This is the guy that every guy wanted to be. And what has shifted dramatically is what it takes now in this context to be 
uh, an aesthetically pleasing man. This is what men are supposed to look like now, right? That is a dramatic shift. Any other thoughts about this? Now, my, my point here is that many of us may or may not be cognizant of how these operative definitions, right, work in our society. Th these are things that we just simply inhere and that work their way into our social equalizer, right? Let me give you one more example. These are um, a collection of Barbie dolls. And what you have is a 1963 doll, a 1971, and a 2013 doll. What do you notice? I mean, I'm glad that it got more diverse as we went on, but it's still lacking diversity in body shape. Um, and it just kind of still is setting those unrealistic standards for women. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and let's, let's just zero in for a moment on body type. What do we notice about the 2013? These are, this I believe is the top model series of Barbie. I mean, especially in the 2013 series, they are showing much more skin than in either of the other ones. That's, yes, that's definitely true. What, do anything else about the way they're constructed? The more movable joints. They're mo movable joints, so you can put them into these sort of fashion poses. They're also exceptionally skinny, right? The Barbie on the far left, the 1963 Barbie is famous for being anatomically incorrect anatomically impossible, right? And, and what we've done now is gone to a, a model of femininity that's profoundly unhealthy and unattainable, but that's sort of linked to a kind of beauty. And so what I wanna signal with this is the function, for example, in here, we also have an invisible operative definition of femininity that some of us, right, uh, come in contact with as children. So these are dolls that are meant to be played with by young girls. And so what, what I think what I'd like to emphasize about this is that when we talk about the concept of social location, who we are, why we believe what we believe, we have to think about not only our identity categories, but also the, in the way in which these larger social definitions function to just kind of structure our thinking around these things, right? Let me add just a couple of quick more examples. Uh, this is the world map. This is the way um, the world map is sort of presented to us with Europe in the middle. Uh, this is the image of the blue planet, the famous um, uh, shot taken from one of the Apollo missions in the 60s. The actual photograph was this. Do you see what the difference is here? What do you notice about these two images? They turn it around so that north is up. Correct, north is up. And what that's done is create a situation in which the United States and Europe are seen as being north of Latin America and Africa, and therefore up. Now, th this, is, this is where things get a little bit more theoretical, but the argument posed is that we now have an operative definition of north or up as being positive and south and down as being negative. If you look in space, the concept of up and down is irrelevant. It doesn't exist. The, the actual concept of north and south is equally relative, right? In this image, the United States is, um, or sorry, Europe would be very far south of Africa in this, in this scenario, right? And this is what some have called the upside down world map. And what they've done is to um, both recenter, right? So take Europe away from the center and also make it more um, uh, reflective of, of sort of this idea of how North and South have no meaning. Uh, let me just ask a quick question. How does looking at the world this way change our perspective? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you guys a, a comparison. We have this map, which is the one that all of us grew up with, and that's the one that's in all of our classrooms. 
and we have this map. What does this map do? It shifts your focus a little bit and what your eye is drawn to. Yeah, and, and so what, do, what does that mean? What's the, what's the effect of that? It's less Eurocentric and you can notice more kind of Asia and Latin America and Africa because they're more with your like eye level. Absolutely. Did, did anybody, as they looked at this map, did they have a little trouble finding Europe? Yeah, I, honestly, what was most disconcerting to me was that the Pacific Ocean is in the center instead of the Atlantic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right, right. And suddenly, suddenly, if we think about this phrase, the center of the world, right, let's, let's go back to this. The center of the world in this context really is situated around Europe. And the United States is very prominent. We could argue that Africa is too, but that, that's a whole different argument. But certainly we're used to seeing Europe right in the middle. Europe is the center of the world. And then when we shift this, it really radically pushes both the United States and Europe off to the sides of the map, changing their relative importance right in our visual field. This is, some would argue, uh, a minor detail. Others would argue that symbolically, this is an enormous way of reshifting our perception of um, these, these sort of geographical places and their place in the world, right? Uh, any, any comments or questions? Did I lose anybody on this one? Okay, I think I have just one more image. This is uh, the true size of Africa. Uh, and what this does is it takes the actual landmass of various places around the world and places them within the actual landmass of Africa, right? What do you know? What does this do? What do you notice about this? Why is why is a map like this important? Because we equate size with importance, and on most projection map projections, Africa is much smaller than it would really be. Right on this on this map that I've that I've gone back to, does this map show us the scale of Africa that we see here? The answer is no. Right, no. and so again. Why would this be important? I, I believe it was Adrian that said that we equate size with, with uh, importance. That's absolutely true. And what else? Why else might this be important? It just kind of makes me think in the historical context of colonization and how a lot of these countries colonized and ruled and used the resources of um, Africa and it, their land masses in reality are much smaller than the land mass of Africa. Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and I'll just add one other quick detail. Think about the enormous regional diversity that we have in the United States. If I said to you, um, you know, that I grew up in San Francisco and somebody said to me, oh yeah, well, that's just like Georgia. Someone would think that was crazy. Right, because we, we are like very cognizant of the enormous regional, geographic, social distance that, ex that exists within the United States. And now look at the United States in proportion to Africa. And yet we consistently homogenize Africa as if it were a single entity, right? And by doing so, we essentially erase some really, really vast, huge, right? diversity within an African continent that is almost unimaginably large, right? It's much bigger than our imagination is used to conceptualizing. So the reason I wanted to go through all of these different, um, let me just stop my sharing here. The reason I wanted to go through the, all of these very different scenarios was just to get us to think about two things. One, how our individual identity categories 
shift over time and how they have such a deep impact on the kinds of experiences we, we have and also the way we see the world. And second of all, how these larger social definitions have that same impact. They shape how we understand things like beauty, definitions of femininity and masculinity, the place of the United States or Europe in the world, what Africa means. Uh, this is what I mean by social location and its impact on who we are and what we believe. Okay, so my final question for you are, do you have questions for me? About either about social location or about life and learning at William and Mary. Any questions about what classes are like? Um, anything like that? Uh, what would your advice be to someone kind of going into the school environment and large, like lectures and classes and kind of your advice for people who might be a little more on the shy side and how to um, get involved in the class? Great question, Erin. I think I have two pieces of advice. I would, um, work consistently at breaking out of my shell with some of my classmates. So um, some professors do this um, more programmatically than others. My classes tend to be on the smaller side, so I consistently switch the seating around and have my students um, sit with different people. I make us learn each other's names as quickly as possible, and I, and I like to switch groups. But I think that um, that's my initiative as a faculty member. But I also think that students do have within their power to sort of try to ship seats, meet different people within the classroom, introduce yourself. That sometimes takes a little bit of initiative, but I found that um, other students are really receptive to that. And the second thing I would suggest is don't be shy about contacting the faculty member that's teaching the courses you'll be in. Go to, the op go to their office hours, uh, follow up with email questions, don't introduce yourself after the second or third day of class just to um, to let them know who you are. Uh, those things, believe it or not, they really make a difference. And I think faculty are genuinely appreciative of students that take that initiative. And also, I would say get involved in student activities. I think that that's a, gr a really powerful way to make William and Mary a, a, an even uh, more intimate and um, manageable place socially. Any other questions? Okay, so let me just do one really quick thing here. I'm gonna, let me see if this works. I'm gonna try to, all panels, I'm gonna put my email here. This is me. Uh, and I, if you have follow-up questions after this session ends or as before, you know, when you're thinking about coming to William Mary or are going to be attending William Mary, feel free to email me. I'm happy to respond. And in the meantime, um, I really appreciated your participation. This felt, this did not feel like a tiny little gathering. This was great. This felt very much like some of the ones I've done in person. So I really appreciate your enthusiasm and engagement. Thank you. Just wanted to come in and say uh, thank you to everybody that participated. Thank you, Professor Rio Frio. This was excellent. Got my wheels turning, got me asking some questions. Um, but just wanted to reinforce that all the content that has been published by Digital DFAS or done by Digital DFAS will be on the welcome pages. So any students, parents, or um, that are interested in this content, you can always visit this wonderful lecture. Um, and hear your wonderful voices in the recording a little later when we upload this to our digital DFAS welcome pages under you belong. So you can always revisit this content and also please reach out to any of us or our office if you have any additional questions. Um, 
I'm not sure if Tish has anything to add, but this has been excellent. No, not much. I just thank you guys. This was awesome. It was, again, didn't feel very much so like a small group. Um, we definitely hope. I'll also tell you, if you have friends that are joining the class um, of 2024, but did not get the opportunity to be here and see this, as Jackie said, it's going to be uploaded. Um, so you guys can have the opportunity to send some other people to come and check out the lecture as well. All right. I think that's that. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being here. Um, and again, reach out if you have questions. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Good night.